and I went to work in there. Eight thousand people work in that place, and uh, was was uh, alive, you know. We got the benefits, the best. But after that, things started going downhill. Like I don't work, I don't work a single hour over time over there over a year now. So it looked like something gonna happen. Connecticut's Naugatuck River Valley. For a hundred years, this was the center of the American brass industry. Many generations of workers depended on the brass mills for their livelihoods, and the industry dominated the social and economic life of the region. Today, most of the brass plants are shut down, and in the few that remain, workers face an uncertain future. Their unions, once able to win some of the best wages and benefits in the region, now have to fight for the very jobs of their members. This is the story of the people who worked in the Naugatuck Valley brass industry from its heyday to its present decline. It's the story of how this industry shaped the lives of thousands of people and how those people in turn have tried to shape their own lives through collective action. It was the early 1800s when Connecticut Yankees first set up brass button shops in the Naugatuck Valley. The brass makers put bits of scrap copper into crucibles and heated them to 2,000 degrees Fahrenheit. Then they threw in powdered zinc and this blended with the copper to create brass. They poured the molten mixture into slab shaped molds and when the slabs were cool, the brass makers squeezed them between iron rollers transforming the slabs into sheets. Finally, they took the brass sheets and stamped buttons out of them, buttons which Yankee peddlers sold door to door. As America grew, the button makers devised new uses for their shiny metal. Hardware, plumbing supplies, kerosene lamps, cooking utensils, snaps, buckles, and bullet cartridges. And as the markets expanded, so did the brass making shops. By the last quarter of the 19th century, the small button shops had grown into large factories. The Naugatuck Valley had achieved a position of strategic importance in the American economy, turning the Yankee brass mill owners into powerful industrialists, and the towns of the Naugatuck Valley into bustling industrial centers. Eventually, there were more than 50,000 people working in brass and brass-related factories up and down the Naugatuck Valley. The vast majority of these workers were immigrants, Irish, Italians, Poles, Lithuanians, Russians, Portuguese, and French Canadians. They settled in close-knit ethnic neighborhoods, which had sprung up throughout the valley. For immigrant workers, these neighborhoods were more than just places to live. They were communities with organizations and institutions that helped people survive in a new and sometimes hostile world. People did have to uh, find a tie because there was a break in the family. They left the family overseas. So they did establish another family unit within their social clubs. Danny Zoraitis is the son of Lithuanian immigrants who came to the Brass Valley city of Waterbury before World War I. As soon as they arrived, they sought out and became active in the organizations of the Lithuanian community. At the turn of the century, the clubs did everything for the ethnic group that belonged to the club. It provided them with a death benefit, provided them with an insurance policy, it provided them with uh, a small payment if they were uh, sick. When the stores were company stores more than anything, the ethnic groups set up their own cooperative stores. But these were started be because they felt that they had to do something where they could control their, uh, their own destiny by uh, making the price fair and equitable to them. And uh, so they did everything in a group.
My mother had boarders, and she worked very hard, very hard. Sarah Capella came to Waterbury from Italy at the age of seven. Her mother, like many other women, helped keep the ethnic community together by taking care of young men who had immigrated here. But they were all people that came from Italy, and the parents used to write to my mother and father and say, my son is coming, please take him. You know, my mother used to say, they want me to take all the kids, where am I going to put them? But she used to try, you know. They were all, they were good uh, people. What kind of uh, work did she have to do for the boarders? What kind of, she had to walk, keep their beds clean, wash all their clothes, cook for them. And you know what she used to charge them? Three dollars a week. In between cooking and cleaning, some women did another kind of work at home. Each day, they or their children would walk to nearby factories to pick up boxes of brass buttons, pins, or snaps, take them home, and mount them onto sales cards by hand. Well, the snaps were in a box, the two, one piece here in this box, one piece, and we took them and put them in those boards, and then took the top, put them in, pressed them, took the cards out, and put another card in, and so on. How much did you get paid for it? Oh, pennies, I forget. In one way or another, the brass industry was the dominant fact of life in the Naugatuck Valley. For immigrant workers, most of their waking hours were spent inside the plants. What they found there was a rigid hierarchy based on nationality. If you were a Yankee, English, Irish, or German, you could become a skilled mechanic or even a boss. If not, then you did the most menial, unskilled jobs with little hope of advancement. In the ranks of the unskilled, the men moved heavy materials around inside the mills with sheer muscle power. Women tended the machinery that turned the brass into finished goods, and children fetched and carried, and sometimes did the work of adults. They worked for a nickel an hour, and uh, they worked 13 hours a day, 12, 13 hours a day. There was no time and a half at that time. and. Uh, and everything was straight time. Russell Sobin remembers his father, a Russian immigrant who began working in the brass mills around 1905. Probably you have about a half hour in between be a, be for a little lunch, a snack, and then they work till nine o'clock at night. From seven in the morning till nine at night. And the work was different. It was all buggy legging days. Uh, there was no cranes. There were may have one or so jitney, you know, a lift jitney that would pick it up, and the rest of it was all, you'd pull it around on wagons, maybe seven, eight ton on that thing, big iron wagons. It was all the foreign element that done all that work. They were the, they were the mules. Life was hard in the brass plants, and brass workers were always looking for ways to make their jobs easier. But when they invented labor-saving techniques or machinery, it was the companies that benefited, not the workers. Haplasky recalls what happened to his father, a Lithuanian immigrant who had many inventions to his credit, but was never paid for them. The way my father was telling me, <coughs> see, in them days, they were all heavy drinkers. Um, uh, this boss of his was also a heavy drinker. So they take him into the saloons and <clears throat> buy him a couple of drinks, maybe half a dozen drinks. At that time, uh, drinks were only a nickel, ten cents a piece. And they put in the paper, you sign your name here, Mike. And that was the end of it. In the early 20th century, the mill owners began developing new ways to manage their growing immigrant workforce. The tone for the new labor policy was set by John H. Goss, member of a prominent mill-owning family. Upon those to whom authority, power, and a comparatively higher intelligence has been given, 
lies a certain degree of responsibility for the welfare and uplift of the less fortunate. Under company paternalism, there were citizenship classes for the foreign-born. There were soccer teams and baseball teams. There were picnics and outings at a lovely park owned by the company. In return, the mill owners expected complete obedience on the job. We didn't have no unions then, and we had to take what they gave us. We couldn't say anything or they'd fire you. The shortcomings of company paternalism were most obvious when it came to workers' health and safety. Accidents were common. In one year, the Scoville Manufacturing Company reported 16,000 accidents, more than the number of people who worked there. And even though some companies provided hospitals and safety committees, their responsibility to workers injured on the job was limited. My father got hurt, hurt down the American Brass, and he, he didn't, uh, he, he, uh, American Brass didn't take care of him at all up until, uh, well, up until the compensation laws came into effect. Then they, then they took him into the hospital and they operated on him, and then the, and then the American Brass paid for it. And before that, did they do anything? Nothing. Nothing. You was on your own. If you got hurt, it was too bad. From the beginning, the fortunes of the brass industry have depended heavily on war. Legend has it that during the War of 1812, one brass company was saved from bankruptcy by an order for brass uniform buttons. The armed forces have always been huge consumers of brass bullet casings, chip fittings, bayonet handles, artillery shells, and, of course, the shiny decorations worn by the top brass. World War I was no exception. For four years, every howitzer shell that exploded in the poppy fields of France, every machine gun bullet that peppered the skies over Belgium, meant profits for the brass industry. In the Naugatuck Valley, business was booming as never before. The brass makers expanded their factories and added tens of thousands of new workers, many of them women who did jobs previously reserved for men. As the war continued, consumer goods fell into short supply, and the cost of living skyrocketed, doubling in five years. The war finally ended in November 1918. The post-war years saw social revolutions in Russia, Germany, and Italy. Here at home, rising expectations, inflation, and other factors led to massive strikes in the nation's basic industries. In the Brass Valley, the cost of living was at an all-time high. There was a severe housing shortage, and paychecks just weren't keeping up with inflation. The thousands of workers who'd been hired for the war effort feared they would lose their jobs. Amid the mounting crisis, one brass company offered this advice. We are producing less and consuming more than we were before the war. The way to combat the high cost of living is for everybody to go to work and produce all he can. It's not the high cost of living that's troubling America today. It's the high cost of loafing. But exhortations to work hard were not enough. The pent-up pressures of the war and its aftermath finally burst out in a rash of strikes up and down the Brass Valley. It began in the spring of 1919, when some immigrant workers formed a committee with a representative from each major nationality in the region. Speaking to one another in 19 different languages, they came up with a set of demands. A wage increase, improvements in working conditions, a reduction in the 55-hour work week, and the recognition of shop committees, informal unions at each plant. In June, they presented the demands to company officials and began walking off their jobs. Within days, 3,000 unskilled immigrants were on strike. 3,000 quickly grew to 5,000. In Waterbury, the area's largest city, an empty lot in a neighborhood called Brooklyn served as unofficial headquarters where strikers came each day to hear speeches and make decisions. The local authorities became alarmed and called out the Connecticut State Guard. John Hollingworth was a member of the State Guard when the strike began. He was a toolmaker born in England, and like many skilled workers, his sympathy was not with the strike. The Polish and Lithuanian were 
going strong for union. And uh, the union, there's no union war break in. But uh, these people, uh, they, were, they couldn't get what they wanted, they, they were going to make trouble. They had a riot going on in Brooklyn. And I had to run, run down. They didn't have, they didn't have a car to go, you had to run down. And uh, the firemen had the fellows pinned up against the wall with a hose. One time we had to form a military square down the center, rifle loaded, no messing around. And they, they were told, uh, if you're attacked, shoot a hit. We were ready, not a shot fired. The strike continued for a week after the confrontations. Then, without fanfare, the mill owners granted the biggest wage increase in the history of the Naugatuck Valley. The workers had won. Confidently, they began joining the unions that sprang up in the heat of the strike. Unions like the Waterbury Workers Association, which later called itself the New England Workers Association. The NEWA was organized along ethnic lines, with a different branch for each nationality. It cost 25 cents to join. As the movement grew, brass company officials made plans to stop it before it became too powerful. Some companies kept files on workers who might become troublesome. Benny Ann Doan, discharged from the Mattituck Manufacturing Company for distributing leaflets. John Andrakitis, arrested for distributing handbills. Giovanni Borgnes, dangerous Italian, is arranging for an international dance. Steve Kaminsky, member of the Russian club, out on probation after selling pamphlets. Anna Homosevich raised a fuss at employment office because her husband was held. She is a leader of Polish radicals. George Doyle, organizer for machinists. The rollers at Scoville are organizing under him. The local police assisted the brass companies by planting spies inside the unions and breaking up meetings. James Tizo was a member of the New England Workers Association. He recalls what happened to an organizer from Massachusetts who had given a speech to a group of Italian workers. When he get off on the stage, they come with us. Right away, I saw him. The police. They put him on a back farm, what are you talking about? Say, you're too smart. They say, stay in Massachusetts. They don't come around over there. Because they says, if you come back over there, says, you get six months in jail. I said, thank you. I said, you don't want me to come back over there? Never come back. Thank you for the six months of jail. I ain't do a goddamn thing if it's wrong. I say, I think this is a true engine. The federal government also got involved. A. Mitchell Palmer, Attorney General of the United States, set up a special division within the Bureau of Investigation, forerunner of today's FBI. He put the young J. Edgar Hoover in charge of this division, whose main task was to infiltrate and destroy immigrant labor groups all over the country. Under the direction of Palmer and Hoover, the government conducted midnight raids against workers and their meeting halls. In the Brass Valley, hundreds were arrested. Many of the foreign-born were deported, and others were charged with sedition. Uh, I know one of the people told me that lived in Vegan Falls that uh, when they uh, started these raids, uh, they deported uh, this person because when, when they came into his home, he was reading the, the Bible in Russian, and he was deported because uh, evidently some of the agents of the Justice Department there uh, didn't realize that uh, he was not reading any subversive literature. He was reading the Bible. Memorandum to the Department of Justice, Bureau of Investigation from Agent in Charge William P. Hazen. Subject. Radical activities in the Connecticut district. The foreign element does not seem to be worked up to any great extent as to demonstrations, etc. And the American brass company officials believe that the raid made by Department of Justice officials has had the desired effect. Retaliating against the workers did nothing to solve the problems that made them organize in the first place. In 1920, those problems got worse. The inflated economy of previous years gave way to a serious recession. The extra brass workers hired during the war were laid off. Many of those remaining suffered demotions and pay cuts. In February 1920, in the Brass Valley town of Ansonia, members of the New England Workers Association went out on strike again. 
To show their patriotism, they put on their Sunday best and paraded peacefully along Ansonia's Main Street, waving American flags. Slowly, the strike spread up the valley to Waterbury. The demands appeared in the newspapers. Minimum wage of 75 cents an hour. Equal pay for women who do the same work as men. The eight-hour day. The abolition of piecework. No discrimination against workers who are active in unions. Recognition of shop committees. In April, mass meetings took place all over the city in many languages. Among the unskilled workers, there was general agreement. They must all strike together, no matter who they worked for or what their job was. Accomplishing this was easier said than done. Uncertainty and confusion plagued the strike movement from the start. Once again, the state guard was called out to patrol the streets. Each day, the press reported that people were going back to work, that it was all the result of radicals and outside agitators. But despite the confusion, thousands of workers left their jobs. Many times, the strikers sent delegations to meet with the factory owners. Each time, the answer was the same. Workers' demands not granted. Finally, somebody unleashed the police on a strike meeting in a church basement, and the strike became violent. June 21st, 1920, the first day of summer. At the Scoville Manufacturing Company, there was a demonstration. The strikers were met by police and company guards. During the confrontation, a 19-year-old striker named Liberato Tizo, also known as Albert Tizo, was shot to death by factory guard John J. Bergen, who was mounted on horseback, and by police officer Fred Hickey. Albert Tizo's brother, James Tizo, remembers that day. Went on the horse. So it started to rain. And this boy, Al Baptizo, he had his umbrella open. That guy on the top of the horse, you see that gets for the pistol. That guy says, stay back. Stay back. And they hit that kid. When they hit that kid, that kid they had his umbrella open. He pushed the him on the horse, in the stomach. That guy pulled a gun and he shot him. When he shot this boy, that boy had a gun. He pulled his gun and he shot the him too. Now he can see that guy. He had a pistol in his hand, but he was already was gone. He can use the him. He can use his pistol. That guy, hey, he get the pistol, he bam, bam, and he shoot him in the ground. That guy's already dead. What are you shooting for? And Mr. Tees, I'll bet Tees, nobody helped him. Leave him on the ground just like a dog. After all, they take all the people in the harbor, 17 people, room. When my father go in the room, he find his son is dead. My father started to cry and he started to swear. What the America respect for the people? What the America doing? What do we do in this country? We know enemy. We know anarchists. We know uh, fascists. We know communists. We, we cut taller. And what happened? The death of the teenage strikers sent a shockwave through the community. Members of every nationality attended the funeral. The streets were lined with police and state guards armed with machine guns. Who was there? Was all the people, all of the people was on the strike, and all everybody was loaded. We had the prisoner and the one to get in the San Jose Harper. It was a German fellow, big guy. He not scared of talking for nobody. He called it rack, a lot of name. He wants to know everybody if he, for the people to move, he shoot the soldier of the police in Kansas. I said, today, he says, we lost the brother. Or defend all of them, or die all of them. 
Hey, you had to see the whole woman. Paul Arca, German, Italian, everyone. But load the pistol. The strikers hung on for another month. Then they slowly drifted back to work. Three months later, the brass companies cut their wages by 10%. In the Brass Valley, the violent repression of the 1920 strike had the desired effect. For more than a decade afterward, workers made few attempts to organize. During those years, the companies preached a gospel of do-it-yourself individualism. But while companies were encouraging workers to go it alone, the companies themselves were merging and combining into huge national enterprises. In the 1920s, the American Brass Company was bought by the Anaconda Copper Mining Company. The Chase Brass Company was bought by the Kennecott Copper Mining Company. And the Scoville Manufacturing Company bought up many of its former customers, like the appliance-making firm of Hamilton Beach. Result? The Big Three. Three nationwide corporations whose control over copper and brass extended from the open pit mines of Montana to the tubing for the radiator of your new Ford sedan. But the mergers of the brass and copper companies did not change workers' lives very much. The problems that spurred them to action after World War I persisted through the 1920s and 30s. Long hours, low pay, dangerous conditions, favoritism, discrimination, and the overwhelming power of the brass companies over the whole region. The big three ran this stuff. They ran a lock, stock, and barrel. Uh, if they didn't like you, you didn't work. If uh, uh, you uh, were a maverick of any kind, uh, you were just a uh, uh, black ball. Now, you know, I, I meant, uh, proving that it was very difficult, but I mean, uh, uh, it wasn't hard to understand. If you got fired from American Brass, you couldn't go to Scoville's next day. You couldn't go to Scoville the next day and get a job. What used to happen is that they never had work for all the machines. So every morning you had to go in there and with your lunch under your arm and wait from 6.30 until maybe half past 8 or 9 o'clock. And the boss would say, you, you, and you. It's the same as they do in the longshoremen down at the docks. And uh, there used to be an awful pile of revolts because uh, some of the guys with large families uh, wouldn't be picked for four or five, six days, sometimes four or five, six weeks. It was terrible because the first place, the noise, the noise was terrific and uh, and that was a dirty job too because we worked in oil. I mean, you went home, you'd get in the tub of the shower, and you'd, just like a water off of the fishing back. I mean, it wouldn't even penetrate for 15, 20 minutes. When the metal was like a razor, you wouldn't know you were cut till you looked down and found them bleeding all over the place. And sometimes you have to fight over gloves. And, uh... When my father came to this country, when he first got a job in the American Brass, there was no such thing as labor movement or whatever. At that time they had no things as blowers and he worked with sandpaper on brass and eventually he got what they called silicosis of the lung and he became quite ill. And uh, the American Brass was very big of them. They gave my father a dollar a day for the rest of his life and we had to supply him with oxygen and stuff every day. And my father, in order to survive, my father needed oxygen because he had absolutely no lungs left from the brass. Uh, they didn't give a damn about workers because the cheapest commodity they had was a worker. If a machine broke down, they had to pay to get it fixed. If a, if a worker got killed or, or got maimed or got, uh, lost an arm or a leg or a finger, uh, the hell, all they had to do was pick up the telephone and get another worker. In the 20s and 30s, a change took place in the brass industry, which created a new set of problems for the workers. The companies introduced time study methods to raise productivity in the plants. They analyzed every job down to the most minute detail, sped up the machines, and reduced the size of work crews. 
Engineers and efficiency experts took away the few vestiges of control that workers had over their own jobs. And the workers resented it. Uh, at one time, there'd be a half hour off and a half hour on. They'd be taking them coils and they'd take turns. And, but after they eliminated that, they got the time study men in and they said, what is that man doing for a half hour? Doing nothing, not only nothing. So they made a soda. One man only worked. Or say, for instance, you were on a shear, and uh, they'd figure out how many cuts you made a minute. Maybe you, for a while you were uh, fresh, but then towards the afternoon you didn't, you, you weren't that strong after you slowed down. So you had to just beat them by working nice and easy at a, at a regular pace, and that's it. After they put meters on the machines, on the rolls, on the shears, and every time that shear come down, that would register. It would, uh, a red line would come down, and it'd tell you, and it'd tell you when you stopped, and tell you when you were going. If one guy wanted a little rest, he'd sit there and he'd hit it with his, push that lever down with his finger. But they'd get caught. In the early 1930s, the nation's economy collapsed into the Great Depression. Thousands of brass workers were jobless. For those who still had work, conditions deteriorated. I was working for 19 and a half cents an hour, 55 hours a week. Now, no overtime, you see, it was all straight time. And, uh, of course, no vacations, no holidays, no nothing, you see. I mean, no pensions, I have those, those things were just pie in the sky. The company said, complete control. A form would stand at a clock Friday and there'd be a layoff. And uh, people would line up to ring out. And a form would stand at that clock and people would sweat because you didn't know who he was going to say, you don't come back Monday, we'll let you know, we need you. And you know, you, you, the wages you were paying was just hand them out. So if you lost three days of work, you were in trouble. As the Depression wore on, many unemployed workers survived from day to day on the charity of the community. A pile of worn out clothing, a bag of groceries. But in the midst of despair, a new spirit of activism was born. Across the country, workers began marching and organizing to win some of the things which they felt had been denied for too long. Justice on the job and the right to form unions. But their efforts were often met with violent resistance from companies and police. In the face of such resistance, workers began developing new tactics, like the sit-down strike. They blockaded themselves inside the plants and refused to come out until they'd won their demands. In the Brass Valley, the Benrus Company was one place where workers won a pay raise by sitting down. Helen Johnson was working there at the time. As we were going out the night before, there was a notice on the, on the clock when we were on that. And I don't remember now, but uh, Waterbury Company's, uh, Waterbury Clock was giving the, their employees a raise. And uh, I was, I'm not quite sure, but, but anyhow, um, we hadn't heard anything. So we came, nobody ever, never, nobody ever knew who started this or wasn't too much said about it. But the next day, we all walked in there in the morning, three floors and with papers and uh, magazine books and all that, and we sat. Meanwhile, in the mining towns of the West, there was a union, the Mine Mill and Smelter Workers. People who belonged to Mine Mill, as it was called, worked in copper and zinc mines that were owned by Anaconda and Kennecott. When the miners went on strike, those companies could live off the profits from their Naugatuck Valley brass plants and defeat the miners by waiting them out. But what if the workers organized themselves in every job, from the mines to the consumer, just like the copper and brass companies had done? Around 1935, the miners pitched in some money to send union organizers to the brass mills back east. There were uh, rumors of uh, a scuttle about that they wanted to uh, start a union, and they called a meeting for a very sp specific small group of people that they might be interested in at Workman's Hall on Spencer Avenue <clears throat> as a socialist organization. We got up there and there was a, a fellow by the name of Jess Gonzalez who was in from uh, Pennsylvania, 
originally, but I think he came out of Montana. He was one of the organizers for uh, Mindless Motherfuckers. <coughs> Very nice guy. Talked to us and explained unionism to us and so forth. Told us how we needed it, and uh, of course we knew it. I mean, he wasn't telling us anything we didn't know. I mean, uh, two years in a factory, you found out the structure, you found out what you were against, you found out if you didn't have the right name or the right connections or the right attitude, uh, you weren't going to go anyplace. Mine Mill was part of a new movement called the CIO, the Congress of Industrial Organizations. The CIO philosophy was this. In each industry, there should be one big union that would include all the workers, whether skilled or unskilled, male or female, Irish or Italian, black or white. And even though that made sense to many workers, actually joining the union was a difficult step. A lot of them didn't want to join. They just didn't want to pay that dollar. And they thought it was, uh, a lot of them had the uh, idea if they joined the union that they would get fired, which they put that fear in a roller would say, well, hey, look, if you join a union, you're going to lose your job. And he used to scare them. They were uh, indicted against unions. I mean, you know, all the press and everything was uh, against unions, radicals and so forth. And uh, we had a beautiful community here and the uh, brass people were so good to us and all that. So we didn't need anything like that. We didn't need any radicals or socialists or communists in this area. And that was the kind of thing that, uh, and most people uh, uh, believed that. Well, naturally, uh, most of these company had a paternalistic attitude towards workers. You know, you don't want no union. Why should you pay dues? We'll take care of you. you know? um, they didn't mention which way they would take care of you. you know? Despite their fear of company reprisal, workers found in the union movement a potential solution to some of the problems they faced at work, and the idea caught on. Some of their demands were the same ones workers had fought for two decades earlier in 1920. Shorter hours, better working conditions, equal pay for equal work. But there were some new demands too, like job security and an end to favoritism in hiring and promotions. The American Brass Company in Waterbury was the first place where workers gained enough strength to call for a union election. Bill Moriarty was on the organizing committee. At that time, you didn't have to show 51% of strength to get an election. You had to show what they call, show interest. In the plan. Well, we showed interest. Uh, and we finally got the election, make a long story short, and won it. But we didn't have a union. All we had was an election won because I don't think we had actually, well, I think if we said 15% of the people in the plant, in the union, it would be exaggerated. <coughs> but it was a step. And uh, we worked on it and uh, finally. Uh, Got a contract, the first contract. All we wanted to do was get somebody's name on a contract, ink it, I mean, you know, because we didn't have any bargaining stick, we knew it, you know. And uh, we got it. As America crept slowly out of the Depression, the mine mill organizing drive gained momentum. The nation was heading towards involvement in World War II, and factories were gearing up for war production. The demand for labor was growing, and workers began to assert their power. They used creative tactics like radio programs and sound trucks. And workers who were already organized helped those who were still struggling for union recognition. After he joined the union, there was a strike at the buckle shop on South Main Street in Waterbury. They asked for volunteers to help support the picket lines because they were all women in the plant. We men were supposed to add militancy to the picket lines. Well, brother, we, they didn't need us because those women were tougher than we ever were. <laughs> yeah, I went down and I parked my car quite an old block, block and a half away, which I don't know what made me do, but I was very happy that I did. And I walked down and there was a big picket line, both solid women there. By the time I got there, I'm watching this woman start through the picket line. By the time she got to the door, she didn't have any clothes on. And, uh, another incident that uh, I really like was that when we're going through 
and uh, all of a sudden she collapsed. And uh, nobody knew what happened. The police came over and they took over the telephone booth and they got a squad car and they took her up and examined her and, uh, to find out what had happened. And uh, they passed a handbag along the picket line, the old, old uh, large cloth handbag. And uh, they handed it down and it came to me and I, yeah, it was pretty heavy. I come to find out there was a frying pan in that handbag. And that handbag had been in the vicinity of the spot where this girl had tried to go through. By the early 1940s, workers at the big three brass plants and at many smaller shops had won formal union recognition. But that was just the beginning. During those years, the workforce itself was changing, mainly because of World War II. Black men were entering the mills in larger numbers. Some white women were doing men's jobs, just like in World War I. And black women, who had been systematically excluded from the brass plants, were finally hired under community pressure. The presence of these groups in the brass industry put the CIO philosophy to the test. Would the union protect all the workers, or just the white men who still dominated the workforce? I got married, I had a child, and uh, my baby was six months old and the war broke out. And they were calling for people in the American brass. And I went down there and I was hired immediately. I worked and then they decided to break me in on welding. But before I got a chance to be broken in on welding, um, uh, some fellow that represented the, the union, I knew nothing about the labor movement. I had no idea what the labor movement was about. He came over and decided uh, that I should be paid more money. Uh, I believe at the time when I started, I was getting either 50 or 75 cents an hour for doing a man's job. I was doing exactly what a man was doing. Um, lo and behold, about a month or two later, they handed me a check for about $100, retroactive back pay, because I was doing this type of work. The union's victory for women proved to be a temporary one. After the war, women like Rachel Doolady had to quit working altogether, or else go back to the traditional lower-paying women's jobs. The better-paying jobs once again became the province of men. As for black workers, the union contract specified equal rights and opportunities for everyone. But deep-seated racial prejudice continued to make that very difficult to achieve. The hot and heavy was always shoved on the, on the blacks in this, uh, in this area. And it would, took them a long time to break into the jobs that were a little better in terms of uh, working conditions, or pay even, uh, than normal because the bosses did everything they could to keep them there because they knew the, the white guys uh, just wouldn't take it for as long as the blacks did. Yeah, like my mother always said she did, that she was always stuck on this certain chucking machine that she ate it. And, uh, Grace Cummings' mother went to work at the Scoville Manufacturing Company during the war. A lot of foremen didn't want blacks in the shop in the first place. They were forced to do it, and, but they would make it hard for you and hope that you would quit. You got the dirty, nasty jobs, you got the jobs that didn't make any money. You just went and did, did your job, get yelled at all day, and come home. Uh, and there hardly, you hardly even knew the, the white girl working next to you. You hardly ever knew her name because she didn't associate with you, you know, even though you were doing the same thing. There were no kind of association whatsoever. John Gaddison went to work at American Brass in 1940. I was, uh, well, hit, dis disliked because of my involvement in, in the union. The uh, particular supervisor just did not like uh, union representatives of any type, any form. I was uh, just like a handyman, floor man, as they call it, and I was looking for um, an increase in pay and I wanted to uh, elevate myself. So I tried to uh, get a job, and he said that he had picked a man. And I said, well, I have the senior. This man come, just come in here, and I've been in here for years. And he said, well, that's all right. That's my prerogative. I said, no, it isn't either. It goes by seniority. 
And he gave me in on that, and I uh, took over the job, and it requires a lot of training. And he said to me, that same foreman, he said to me, he said, well, I've got to give it to you because my superiors told me I have to give it to you. But there's the job. You take it, but nobody's going to break in. You're going to break yourself in. And if you can't do it in so many days, then you don't have the job. By the onset of World War II, Mine Mill was becoming a significant force in the American labor movement. Its 60,000 members spanned every segment of a thriving copper and brass industry, and its president sat on the executive board of the CIO. But then, a bitter internal dispute broke out, the first in a series of events that would eventually lead to the decimation of Mine Mill. In 1941, John Driscoll, a mine mill organizer and a native of Waterbury, claimed that Mine Mill's top leadership was following the political line of the Communist Party. Reed Robinson, president of Mine Mill, condemned Driscoll's attack as nothing but a personal power grab. The following year, Driscoll unsuccessfully challenged Robinson for the presidency of the Union. Two rival factions formed within Mine Mill. Robinson's forces were called the Left Wing Faction, and Driscoll's group was called the Right Wing Faction. There were charges and countercharges, and throughout World War II, the Mine Mill and Smelter Workers Union was at war with itself. The struggle was particularly fierce in the Brass Valley. The right wing group, uh, as well as the left wing group, you know, used to be throwing snowballs at one another rather than fighting the company, we were fighting each other. In fact, I recall distinctly every time we went to a meeting and then at night, uh, you know, everybody try to get to the back of the hall, so you'd have to be, your back would be against the wall rather than have somebody come behind you and hit you with a chair or something, you know. I know I used to feel awfully bad. I'd go in and people I work with, I'm standing on this side of the hall and people I work with all there standing over me. And say, we were really at each other, you know, dog eat dog, and it was very bad. The growing menace of communism arouses the House of Representatives Un-American Activities Committee. Among the well-informed witnesses testifying is J. Edgar Hoover, head of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. Mr. Hoover speaks with authority on the subject. The factional fight within Mine Mill came to a head right after World War II, when America was in the grip of the biggest Red Scare since the Palmer Raids of 1919 and 1920. A leading figure in this was J. Edgar Hoover, the same man who had directed the attack on immigrant labor groups after World War I. Communism in reality is not a political party. It is a way of life, an evil and malignant way of life. It reveals a condition akin to disease that spreads like an epidemic. And like an epidemic, a quarantine is necessary to keep it from infecting this nation. Companies everywhere were quick to exploit public sentiment, and they used the fear of communist influence as a way of discrediting the entire labor movement. In the Brass Valley, the Scoville Manufacturing Company attacked unions in editorials like this one. Labor unions are particularly susceptible to infiltration by communists. The strike weapon is largely controlled by an aggressive minority. Disruption of production, violence, and hardship which accompany strikes are essential parts of the communist creed of revolution. We say, give them back to Russia. In 1947, Locals loyal to the right-wing faction seceded from Mine Mill and eventually joined the United Auto Workers. Two years later, Mine Mill was expelled from the CIO, along with 10 other unions that were accused of being communist-dominated. Mine Mill was deprived of all rights under federal labor laws and suffered years of harassment, subversive activities charges, and raiding by other unions. In 1967, a seriously weakened mine mill merged with the United Steelworkers of America. With the workers now split up into different unions, it became more difficult for them to bargain with the giant copper and brass corporations. Workers like John Gaddison were keenly aware of how strong they might have been if they'd stayed in one union. That was one of the best setups that, you know, we could have had because you're dealing strictly in one industry. But, uh, Things went wrong, and Mine Mill went under, and then we were chopped up, and we've been kind of powerless since then. Not that force 
if we had a got out of mine mill, lock, stock, and barrel, and went into the uh, steel workers or went into the auto workers or whatnot, but if we should have all gone one way. The reconversion of war plants to peacetime pursuits is going ahead at full speed, and once more the automobile factories are humming as huge stamping presses form the bodies of the first automobiles produced since the spring of 1942. Many new inventions will grace store shelves. This cordless iron, for example, eliminates many of the nuisances connected with the family wash. Store windows are once more blossoming as they did before Pearl Harbor with every gadget dear to Americans. And by the thousands, people are flocking to automobile display rooms. The United States of America emerged from World War II as the world's dominant economic power. And by the early 50s, the nation was enjoying the biggest economic boom in its history. With raw material from dozens of lands, American workers were turning out an endless stream of products, from industrial machinery to portable radios. Soon, one-third of all the world's exports were coming from the U.S. For workers, the question was, how much would they benefit from all this prosperity? The answer to that would depend largely on how strong their unions were. But in the Brass Valley, many local unions were still weak. Weak from the union factional struggles, and also weak because of the stiff opposition of Brass Company management. Alan Curtis, vice president of the Scoville Manufacturing Company. Many negotiators enter negotiations with the attitude, what will I have to give the union this time? But management should enter negotiations with the definite policy that it will not give away or dilute management's rights. In 1952, union contracts expired at many plants in the Brass Valley, and 10,000 workers went on strike. The key struggle was at Scoville. It was the biggest brass plant in the area, but among its thousands of workers, only a small minority were actually union members. Sid Monty was president of the Scoville local at that time. The company felt sure that they could beat us in a strike, and Curtis was the ringleader. In fact, he made statements to several people among management pe personnel of other plants, who later let us know about it, that this was the time to take them on once and for all to break their back. And to tell you the truth, I think we had collected dues from 600 mem members the month of May. And when that strike was called, well, I was looking to see if my pants would be dirty because I didn't know how many people were going to go in. But boy, it was wonderful. I don't think 150 people went in that plant that day. Scoville had a history of being uh, uh, SOBs as far as the workers were concerned. And they were so big, and they employed so many, that they had, everybody in town had some relative or, or a very good friend working in Scovels and they knew they had been mistreated. The solidarity began because people in this town were just fed up. And I think they realized that we were fighting for their good. Comes a time you have to fight for what you believe in, I think that was the time. The response to the strike was completely unexpected. By the third day, there were more than 2,000 people on the picket line in front of Scoville's main gate. In the weeks that followed, the company and the workers fought on many fronts. They used every trick in the book. They, they turned uh, you against your union organizer or union rep. Uh, they tried to turn you against the local. They, they, the boss would call. They, they, then they got the telephone bit going. They, they would call you, tell you if you don't come back, you're going to lose your job. There was no, you know, they didn't say you were fired. They didn't use the word you were fired. They said that, you know, if you doesn't come back, you're going to lose your job. They told her, I got word out to certain people, to other companies, not to hire people that was on strike, so that that way they couldn't hold out, they wouldn't survive. Creditors just, like, mounted and called and threatened to come and get the refrigerator out the kitchen. So, you know, it was, it was, really, um, it was really rough. While the company applied economic and psychological pressure, the strikers received encouragement from sometimes unexpected quarters, as Sid Monty did when he was arrested on the picket line for allegedly attacking a truck driver. 
and this is the sergeant that took me down. Uh, one round Nolan, he's an old time fighter, and he was saying his beads all the way down, saying, yeah, you know, he apologized to me, I'm sorry, you know, because he had a whole list of people from his family that worked in schools and got mistreated. Uh, they, uh, we had public support. And of course, I know if I wanted to be a scab, I don't think I'd have nerve enough to do it. You, know, you got followed. I remember being out in one gate, mostly men come, and we'd try and stop the cars. And, and this one car guard came in, and he was really fresh and on. So I looked over, and we had some big guys over there on the picket line. I just looked up, and I said, hey, fellas, uh, you insist going there. How about give me a hand rocking the car? Well, they over they came, you know, and they were really intimidated because they were big bruises. And they all grabbed the handle of the car and we were rocking it and rocking the cops looking the other way and they didn't see nothing, you know. And we were out of the way of the management pretty good. They didn't have no cam we always checked to see if they had any cameras on it. And uh, he took off. He almost killed us when he didn't back up so fast, but he took off. And then at night time we'd get together and we'd go out. I used to drive the car most of the time with the fellows in there. We did a little damage around them. We had, we had to get back at them some way. It was a good summer. They had egg on their face, so they had to brazen it out too, but it really made us solid. After many months on strike, the workers at Scoville got their contract, providing them with wage increases, pensions, paid holidays, a better seniority system, in short, a piece of the prosperity that American industry was enjoying. The principal thing that they did was to, to recognize that by staying together, they could achieve certain objectives. They could solve some of the problems that were prevalent in Department X, Y, or Z. We solidified a union, that's what we did. We made a, a trade union out of a, guys, a bunch of guys who were reluctantly playing dues by hand. You said people got brave, but they... Yeah, yeah, it was, like, they got union stewards, and people got, uh, you know, talk up to the boss, like, you know, this is not right, I'm not going to take it, I'm not going to work on this machine today, and this, that, and the other, and uh, they really did, they, they learned to speak up. The strike of 1952 was a turning point for the Brass Valley. A process of organizing which had begun in the depths of the Depression seemed to be paying off on the threshold of post-war prosperity. The economic boom rolled on with a few interruptions right into the 1960s. As their incomes rose and job security increased, many workers left their old ethnic neighborhoods and bought homes in the suburbs. They bought cars, enjoyed longer vacations, and could look forward to sending their children to college. Meanwhile, their unions took their place alongside other institutions in the Naugatuck Valley. They got involved in public service and political campaigns. The unions treated their power and respectability with care, becoming guardians of stability as well as agents of change. By the 60s and 70s, the hardships and militant union struggles of the past had begun to seem like ancient history. To many workers, yearly wage and benefit increases were now simply a matter of course. Uh, I, I, I saw it gradually getting where there were fewer and fewer people uh, rallying to the cause, as it were, uh, than there was in the original instance, uh, for example, in the case, immediately following the strike. Uh, you know, you couldn't get a hall big enough to hold a, a monthly membership meeting. Then all of a sudden you can ha have a monthly membership meeting in a telephone booth unless you were having ratification of a contract. I think um, we get very complacent. Uh, like I think I told you before, I remember this old Italian man always said to me that uh, he was a smart old man. And he used to say, uh, trouble of the people's bellies are full. You take things for granted. I think people get cynical. And it's very hard to get anything accomplished. And it just takes so long, like arbitration cases take six months to a year. And they just don't see any end to it. And they figure what little you accomplish, what's it worth? Labor unions, well, I, I, think, I can think of some of my own friends, you know. 
when they first did that. So they were really lean. Now they're, well, they really need outside girdles to keep the bay window in. And you know, you can't, and they've lost touch with the little guy, and that's bad. In the post-war decades, women and minority workers have increasingly been the little guy in the brass plants. They comprise a large segment of the workforce, but the leadership of their unions often fails to reflect either their numbers or their concerns. We would have some of the officials, uh, the union officials, uh, sitting down and trying to help us work out a uh, plan whereby uh, there were bigger uh, uh, promotions, uh, not, not only in the um, plant, but also in the ranks of the uh, organized labor. You see, and they never disagree with you. They always agreed with you, and uh, always help you work out a uh, something that's very good on paper. But uh, at night or some other time, you find also they go right behind your back, and uh, you know they, it's a different story. And uh, when these things were found, naturally, it was discouraging. The local unions should now do some planning on how to get the maximum contributions to this year's drive. Most other international unions have now raised their requested contributions to five and ten dollars per member. The role of the women in the union is not good. Uh, they're a little better than they were, but women are used. Women do the dirty work and not recognize. And that goes on today. But to take, uh, to take leadership, no. And as I said, we were not encouraged. Despite the efforts of women and minority workers to achieve equality, the brass industry workforce remains divided. Black workers face prejudice at work and in their communities. While most women remain segregated in the lower paying manufacturing jobs, like their mothers and grandmothers before them. They've had women come in there, and they get harassed and all, and takes a really strong woman to make it because guys will make all sexist comments all the time. And they won't give her a break, they give another guy coming in the mill. They're keeping the women out of the mill, they're keeping the men in there and keeping men and women fighting, blacks and whites fighting. They keep the people, guy working next to you every day, he's a black guy, you talk to him every day. And then you get on the outside and they tell you that he's gonna move into your neighborhood and make it slummy. He's in your neighborhood, he's right next door to you and working. You get along fine, but somehow on the outside he's somebody different. Yet this boss who's getting on your case every day, it's all right if he lives next door. I mean, they just keep us fighting each other so that we don't contend with the real problem, who's really bothering us. The divisions that plague the workforce in the Brass Valley have been aggravated in recent years by the fact that workers have all been competing for fewer and fewer jobs. The problem began in the 50s, as copper and brass met with stiff competition from new materials, like plastic and aluminum. Dozens of manufacturers were switching over, and the Naugatuck Valley Brass Companies lost one customer after another. But that's not the whole story. Worldwide, the market for copper and brass was actually expanding. Foreign brass makers were building modern production facilities and were able to capture a bigger share of the world market. The big three, Scoville, Anaconda, and Kennecott, began lagging behind. But they were already involved in a multitude of other businesses around the world, so they simply took their profits from the Naugatuck Valley and invested them elsewhere. As their brass plants grew old and obsolete, they usually chose to shut them down rather than refurbish them destroying thousands of jobs along the way. This process reached a crisis point in the mid-70s when the brass companies tried to force concessions from the workers by threatening massive shutdowns and layoffs. It was the biggest challenge to confront the Brass Valley unions in the four decades of their existence. Sometimes they were able to hold their ground. Sometimes they weren't. The first showdown came at Chase Brass, the Kennecott subsidiary. By then, Bill Moriarty was a UAW staff member. In Chase's, we had made more concessions to that company than any other brass company in this whole area. We gave them relief in areas where 
it was dangerous for us to do that. Now the committee was saying that uh, we have to wear hard hats all over the plant because the bricks are falling out of the roof. But they were kept conning us into, if you give us a little more time, we'll stay in business. So, well, it was reported to me during the negotiations that the Board of Directors Chase had voted a year and a half prior to the termination of the contract that they were going to close down the Chase Brass and Waterbury. And I confronted them with that across the bargaining table, and they did not deny it. In 1976, Chase, as planned, shut down its major Waterbury operations forever. Today, the Chase parent company, Kennecott Copper, is a subsidiary of Standard Oil of Ohio. In 1977, workers faced a similar situation at Anaconda, another of the big three brass makers. By 1960, Anaconda was well underway with a plan to transfer its assets out of the Naugatuck Valley. They shut down production lines, tore down buildings, and slashed the workforce by 50%. At the same time, they were expanding their facilities in Mexico, Brazil, Puerto Rico, and many other countries. In 1977, Anaconda was bought by Arco, the Atlantic Richfield Oil Company, for $700 million. The resulting company was one of the largest in the world. Arco attempted to roll back many of the gains Anaconda workers had made over the years. They imposed a combination of speed-ups and compulsory overtime and maintained the threat that if workers were not productive enough, their plant might be shut down. When I got there, 16 years ago, we had over, a little over 1,000 employees. Today, we got 450 people. We're putting out twice as much work with half of the employees we had 10, 15 years ago. <laughs> Everybody else, when a guy retires years ago, the job went up for bid. Today, they just, before that guy's going to get out six months earlier, they're looking around, who could they add that job onto, okay? And maybe we'll throw them five cents an hour or six cents an hour. Maybe we won't throw them anything. We've made this plant operate not on new equipment. You know, the company has not made it operate on new equipment. The employees have kept the plant running on productivity. I've worked 80, 90, 100, 110 hours a week. 110 hours a week? Right. Sure. And if and you don't, you lose your job. And if you don't, they're telling you. You're going to get a warning. You're going to get a warning or three days off, or we'll take it to arbitration. You know, you go out when we want you, we'll call you. You know, and this is what they're trying to do to us now. They want to dictate more. They'll, they want to be the ones to say how many hours is sufficient to work. If they say you have to work 120 hours, either work it or goodbye, find another you know. job. You're just another machine, and, and it, it just gets to you. You're told to push more and everything. You work more, produce more, and they don't take it into consideration that you have your point where you can't do anymore. And plus, they'll constantly retime your job to see, try and pick up any little trick an operator learned, which is his trick. He doesn't owe it to the company, but... They figure you work there, you owe everything to the company. Six months after Arco took over Anaconda, union contracts expired at many of Anaconda's brass plants, including those in the Naugatuck Valley. 
a coalition of unions was involved in negotiations. The machinists, the UAW, and the steelworkers. Anaconda told the workers that the company had lost its competitive edge because of excessive labor costs and demanded wage and benefit concessions. Donald Doyle, a spokesman for Anaconda. We have to be competitive. And along with that comes uh, the unfortunate part of, of telling people that, in essence, they've been overpaid for a number of years. Because they lived beyond their means for several years doesn't mean that they shouldn't now uh, conform to what the demands of society are. The alternatives are not very good. What would they be? What they would be closing the facilities and not having jobs is and that, not having a brass division business. Is that a possibility, a real possibility? Well, of course. If, if we've seen a third of our operations close in the past 10 years, we've seen 50% of the bargaining unit people laid off and their jobs ended in 10 years, uh, then there's nothing that, that precludes a continuation of that kind of thing if the division can't become profitable and can't become competitive. They want to cut wages, we know we ain't going to let them. As simple as that. If they cut retirement and cut your friend benefits and everything else, that's cutting wages. Plus, uh, they do away with cost of living. You turn the TV or radio on, what's on there? This is going to go up within the, 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 the next few days. This is going up. I, I mean, hey, so is everything going up? The creation of the fight is with the companies themselves. They, they have problems that they ha have not been able to uh, solve, and they figure the easiest way out is to take and lower the wages, and then all their problems are going to be solved. Now, if we're going to start this kind of a trend in this area, and then it's going to mushroom into other areas, where is labor going to wind up at? Early in the strike, Anaconda won an injunction limiting the size of the picket lines. They tried to keep the plants running with white-collar employees, something the company had never done in any previous strike. And they invited strikers to return to work individually without a contract. They've ran a vicious campaign. They've sent people letters. they phoned people. Now we got an individual up there, I won't mention names, we call him the Fuller Brush Man. They even send him to the people's houses asking them to come back to door work. Door to door. Door to door, like the old full of brush man, you know? Uh, what do you got to offer today? In March 1978, Anaconda dropped its demand for wage concessions and offered a small cost of living increase. The steelworkers local in Ansonia turned it down because the contract did not address the issues of speed up and compulsory overtime in their plant. But within the nationwide coalition, a majority voted to accept the offer and everyone went back to work. The strike had lasted six months. For a lot of the guys, it was a shock into real reality. They thought, that it was a great company and they had a great job and they were secure. They finally found out that they aren't as secure as they thought they were. When I started in 68, there was a difference. Back then, all the older timers were saying, look at how good you have it today. We had it so tough. But it seems like now things are swinging around. We've, we're getting it tough again. We're fighting overtime. We're fighting for our wage. They want to take our money away. We're fighting to keep up with the price of oil, which my company produces. I, I, I mean, it's like the, you, we're fighting the old fights again. In the mid-70s, Scoville was still the biggest employer in the Naugatuck Valley brass industry. But by then, Scoville was also a billion-dollar conglomerate, and its aging brass plants were a drag on the company's profits. 
In 1975, a group of investors made a deal to buy the plants at a bargain price, with loans that were guaranteed by the state of Connecticut. There was one hitch. The buyers and the state insisted that the workers take a three-year wage freeze, or else the whole deal would fall through and the plants would close down forever. So the workers took the freeze, and the Scoville Brass Plant became Century Brass Products Incorporated. Alex Lopez has worked in that plant since 1953. After this man come down and bought the place, you know, of course he, he do good. But he, he feel, you know, they feel like a hero, you know, we save, I save, you know. But he make his money, and after that, we only get one race, that's all. But see what they do? Most everything is peaceful. It's a system they got, you know, to make people work. You work peace work, you don't need no boss around you. See? You just work. If you don't work, you don't get paid. So later on, they come down and they cut the prices. Now they got to work so hard to make the time. Sometimes by minutes to 12, but they still going, you know. Sometimes 12 o'clock, they still going. So, otherwise, they, the raise they give, they get them back again. have a man to sweep up the place and there's nobody doing that no more like they used to sweep around with the machine no they only do uh, emergency you know like the machine I gotta fix the machine first you know because that machine but the floor hey never mind we don't use that floor for nothing you just gotta break your neck that's so good you go in the alley or grease and it's about a stick. So the whole idea is to save money. Yeah, money. In five years, Century laid off 500 employees. While their production facilities deteriorated, Century executives drew generous salaries and bonuses and used Century Brass assets to buy up other companies. 1981 was a contract year. Management's claim, the company had no money. They demanded another three-year wage freeze and a reduction in benefits. Most importantly, Century wanted the right to stop making pension fund contributions. Strike, strike. Where I woke, dog on it. Woke for a strike. Taking everything away from me, gotta get something. The benefits. People can only take so much. We've taken six years of aggravation. Each brother and sister in this union have put up with enough aggravation. Now we want some decency. We're going down, we're going down too long. Taking away a man's pension is about as wrong as you can get. And anything that ain't worth fighting for ain't worth having. And this time we're fighting. That's right. The company wants us to live in poverty, and we can't do that. The locale for this confrontation was all too familiar. It was the same plant gate where thousands of immigrants had marched as members of the New England Workers Association in 1920. And it was the same plant gate where the children of those immigrants had picketed during the big strike of 1952. I think you, you think the goddamn the whole police force was in there. And they jumped on everybody, they pulled them on the ground, hit them on the head. I got mace in my eyes. They got one poor guy, the guy's an old man. They hand him up again, they handcuffs on him. For God's sake, what the hell is this? I see the cop with my own eyes push an old lady. That's how much respect they got for us. We're doing what we gotta do. Let them do what they gotta do. They ain't gotta get pushed. They said they wanna arrest me. Listen, I'm right here. I'll be out in a minute. A minute. The union's behind me. Started to while they're trying to let the cars, and naturally you're not gonna let the cars. They're that easy, you know. 
like you could have done with the nurses. They let one in at a time and wait but no. They had them lined up all down here, all around. Yeah, a flea couldn't have got through here. Early in the strike, Century announced that they were on the verge of liquidating their assets and going out of business for good. Negotiators quickly worked out a compromise. The workers would take a one-year wage freeze, and Century would keep the plant open. The workers took the freeze and went back to work. Six months later, parts of the mill were operating only part-time, or not at all, and many workers were on layoff. Right now, Everybody, not just me, but everybody is wondering, you know, what's going to happen? And in my case, I am in the spot, because too, I got almost 29 years in there, but I'm not old enough to retire. So if anything happens now, I don't know what, what I'm going to get. I think it will happen a lot of places these days, you know. They, it's, the future is very in the dark, like. The corporations have only one thing in mind, and that's to make profit no matter who the hell has to suffer for it. And the worker has, uh, you know, he's, he's up against it when he's got that kind of a, of a situation uh, confronting him uh, in his place of employment. He doesn't mean anything except how much he can produce in terms of dollars for the corporation. He doesn't mean a damn thing. When the corporations and companies were making gigantic profits, they never did want to share with the worker. The workers always had to struggle. And uh, no progress has ever been made without struggle in the labor movement. Nobody has been willing to give the laboring man anything unless he has fought for it. We do have, we all, each coming generation, a better life. And that is one, uh, one of the things I feel that we're put on this earth to make life better for those to come after us. <laughs>